Hello everyone and welcome back to video number five, the final video in fact in our journey through macroevolution. So I'm recording or I should say re-recording this video in um, November 2021 because some of the science has actually changed since I delivered this last year so I thought it would be good to update it. So without further ado let's move onwards and let's look at Evo Devo. So the title of this slide says the key question which is what is Evo Devo? So I'm, so I'm sure you're aware, we've talked a fair bit over the course of this course so far, that wasn't great, but you know what I'm saying, about DNA and also about morphology. So these two things, the anatomy of an organism and its, um, its DNA, the molecules in its cells, are linked by the process of development, so the development of an organism. Evo, Evo Devo is otherwise known as evolutionary developmental biology, and this uses the study of development in organisms to investigate evolutionary topics. That really is it. So it's looking at how organisms develop and seeing what the, that can tell us about the evolution of um, those organisms more broadly. Just be aware, as I'm going through this, that the development of an organism from a, an egg into a grown-up um, is sometimes called its ontogeny. So that includes everything from the single cell stage, the egg I mentioned, through the embryo all the way to the grown-up. It includes, for example, metamorphosis in organisms that have such a, um, a resting stage in their life cycle. And many trends that we see in macroevolution can actually be directly related to the development of the organisms, which is why I'm mentioning it, mentioning it, introducing it as part of these lectures. They could be, for example, linked to shifts in ontogeny, so shifts in when development happens in the development of an organism, or differences in the timing and duration of different parts of the de development of a grown-up. So, for example, a giraffe's long neck is due to um, uh, an extended period of development of the neck vertebrae within this group. As such, studying development can help us um, untangle some important aspects of evolutionary biology. A really fine example of EU Devo and the one that I've put on this slide is that of the genes which control development. So like everything else, development is under genetic control. That makes sense, right? And in recent years, it's been recognized that some of the genes um, that are responsible for different elements of development are shared broadly within the animals, for example. A set of these are called the homeobox genes. These are conserved across animals and they likely have an origin prior to the Cambrian period. And you can actually see on the left hand side here some of these um, different genes in different colours um, being mapped to um, different aspects of the anatomy of both a, um, a lab fly, Drosophila, and a human developing uh, embryo here on the bottom. So these genes are responsible for, for example, um, anterior through to posterior structures in the de development of both of those organisms, despite the fact they share a common ancestor probably over 540 million years ago. So what does this mean? Well, the same genes between those groups are responsible for assigning distinct spatial or positional identities to cells in different regions along that anterior-posterior axis. That's just a different way of saying what I just said. Bear in mind in all of this that the genetics of development are really, really complicated. It's not like a simple, um, this gene does that thing because you have genes that turn other genes on and off and those genes in turn could turn other genes on and off. We're starting uh, today to untangle some of these more complex elements of um, Evo Devo using modern techniques which allow us to see when genes are expressed during embryological development. Some examples in the uh, fly Drosophila are shown on the right hand side here. And these use fluorescent molecules, uh, an approach called in situ hybridization, to see when in a developing embryo a particular sequence of DNA is being expressed and thus allowing us to try and understand what aspect this has on the grown-up alongside another uh, a range of different techniques that allow us to experiment on the um, evolution of, or sorry the evolution the development of embryos so this brings us to how the study of development 
can help us when it comes to understanding evolution more broadly. So this is the idea of Evo Devo. I wanted to give you an example, and, uh, and for that example, I've chosen the arthropods. They're a super important group that we've actually talked about previously. So these are creatures that have segmented limbs, they have an exoskeleton, they molt um, as they grow, um, they molt their exoskeleton. Um, they show a, a suite of common characteristics. However, within the group, there has been a long-term argument which fundamentally impacts on our picture of the evolutionary relationships and thus evolution within this group. And that argument surrounds the nature of their head appendages. So arthropods are segmented creatures. Presumably there was a common ancestor that had a very simple segmentation of very similar segments all the way down. However, in the groups that are alive today, the anterior most segments, those towards the front, um, are combined into the head. And trying to work out which head appendage relates to which across the groups is the crux of the argument that scientists have been having since the 1950s. So for example, on the left hand side here, we have a spider. These fangs are mouth parts. They are the anterior most, we think, um, pair of mouth parts in the spider. But what do they relate to within this insect? Do they relate to the, uh, the antennae of this insect, for example, or its mouth parts, its mandibles here? Or do they relate to actually the front of its head, a thing called, um, or there's a structure here that some people may think is um, a highly evolved, derived, I should say, limb. This is a, a topic that was argued over for decades, but in recent years, it's become largely resolved based on congruent signals between Hox gene expression domains and neuroanatomy. So actually looking at which genes express in which segment has allowed us to line up with more confidence which segment of the head, and in particular the brain, um, of each head appendage corresponds to which. And that allows me to tell you, for example, that a spider's fangs evolved from the same ancestral limb in an ancestral arthropod as did the antennae of the insect that's shown on the right here. This diagram in the middle actually places that all together into a single evolutionary tree and shows how across the, um, the arthropods and their closest living relatives, the tardigrades and the onychophons, we can now line up the different elements of their head, in part because we can use EvoDevo to allow us to to um, make that call. So that process, this Evo Devo approach, has clarified the deep arthropod tree of life to a degree. So that's really, really cool. I wanted to spend some of um, this video talking about another really cool example of a major transition in evolution. Now I've talked in the extinction lecture about how important insects are. For example, I told you they make up more than 85% by many estimates of all known species diversity. So they are a really important group. And they also provide a really good example of a macroevolutionary event and how Evo Devo can help us understand this. In particular, I'm talking about insect wings. The majority of insects are winged and they fly. But where those wings come from is a major and at the moment unanswered question. So I'm afraid you're not going to see a 100% uh, confident answer on this one. There is some uncertainty here. Insects as a whole, or the group that includes the insects, the hexapods, we know had come onto land by about 390 million years ago. Then we have a long gap really in their fossil record uh, before they reappear in the fossil record about 315, 315 one five, that is, 3.15 million years ago, um, fully winged, and we don't have any fossils that really record that transition. So we don't really have a clear picture from the fossil record of how wings have evolved. And these, their wings um, also differ from those of bats or birds. In both bats and birds, we know that the wing that they used to fly is a modified forelimb, right? still got finger structures in the case of the bat, so that's quite clear. In the case of insect wings, we don't have that clarity. We don't know what the precursor structure was because like other hexapods, i.e. Um, members of this, th this group and um, insects without wings, all have three pairs of limbs. 
none of those have been modified to create wings in the winged insects. As such, where insect wings have come from is a major question. Um, and it's a major question which, until I suppose even five years ago, we didn't really have a clear answer on. We've, we've argued about it a lot. Um, let me first introduce that argument before giving you an insight into what people think today that's been informed by Evo Devo. Up until um, the last five years, there were two primary theories of wing, of wing, of wing development. The first is that insect wings evolved from uh, structures called the paranotal lobes. So these are fixed extensions of the um, the the uh, kind of the dorsal, the, the back surface of the thorax of the insect. Okay, so they've developed the these structures in this idea have developed just from basically a plate that's the side of the body wall of the insect. Under this theory, these things, paranatal lobes, may have provided early insects with the ability to glide. And eventually, with uh, the acquisition of an articulation at the base of these structures, they may have been used for controlling the aerial descent of insects from perches on tall plants. This is shown on the left-hand side here. So that's one theory right there, coming down from trees and using extensions of basically the body wall. In contrast to this, the second traditional theory is the gill theory, the one that's shown on the bottom left here. And that hypothesis hypothesizes wing origins um, from, uh, or it hypothesizes, I should say, that wings are homologous to, do you remember that phrase from Rob's lecture? Um, so they're, they're kind of the same ultimate structure as the movable abdominal gills that we see today on aquatic insect uh, nymphs, so insect nymphs that live in water. In particular, for example, mayflies, their, their juveniles are called naiads and they live underwater and they have external gills. And in this case, this origin theory for insect wings, the gill itself would be a modified um, extension of a hypothetical um, leg segment that's called the epicoxa. The name doesn't matter. But basically, what this is saying is that both the wings and the uh, gills within this group have been modified from a limb-based structure in a common ancestor. Interestingly, the latest Evo Devo work on this points towards the unification of those two seemingly incompatible hypotheses. So a lot of recent work in Evo Devo suggests that insect wings use genes that are involved in both the development of the body wall, as in this theory up here, so that's this one shown here, and um, genes that are involved in the development of the limbs, so that's this yellow zone here, and those two um, unrelated tissues may have, uh, have combined to create this key step in wing evolution. So Evo Devo in this case is moving us forwards in our knowledge of insect wings in unexpected directions. Um, and in particular, the reason I'm re-recording this video is because in the last year, after I did the, the last version of this lecture in 2020, we've had further developments in this argument. So there are a series of papers that I've linked here on the bottom of the slide that you can see that compared the development um, of insects versus a crustacean, the animal that's shown on the top here. And this makes sense because we think actually that insects are just highly derived crustaceans. The f paper by uh, Bruce and Patel, this one here, used a, a different approach, so also an Evo Devo approach, but they used the phenotypes for the knockout of five leg patterning genes in crustaceans. So if you um, basically take five genes that we know pattern legs in crustaceans, um, you knock them out so they no longer function, um, and then you look at the impact that has on both the crustaceans once they reach their adult phenotype, but also in insects, you can then align the segments of insect and crustacean legs, as shown up here in this nice color-coded diagram. And all of this together allowed them to suggest that crustacean legs um, have 
two leg segments that were present in the common ancestor of insects and crustaceans, but have since been incorporated into the insect body. So essentially what they're saying is that you've got a series of segments that you see in a crustacean. Those were present in the last common ancestor of insects and crustaceans, but those bits of the leg in an ancestral insect have moved up into the body of the insect, and in particular may have moved into the dorsal surface, the back kind of the back surface, um, and later gone on to form insect wings. So the crux of this suggests that insect wings may not be novel structures, but instead may have evolved from existing ancestral structures um, within the insects. But you can compare that to this paper here. This is the one, um, the one a paper that was released in the same issue of the same journal. So I might just pause to get a drink of water. So the second paper, the authors um, agree that the lateral body wall, the kind of the pleural plates, the plates on the side of the insect body, are homologous to some of the, the, the proximal most leg segments of crustaceans. So, so this is something the papers agree on. And they also actually agree that the wing incorporates body wall components that are derived from crustacean legs. So both these papers are in agreement on that, which is really good. But then these two papers actually disagree on the exact origins of the wings, i.e. which particular plate led to the wings. The first paper I mentioned suggests that the wings are homologous to only the kind of the dorsal most plate, the one furthest to the back. Um, whereas the second um, paper suggests that the wing is derived from a combination of two body wall regions, the one on the back and the one on the side. So both studies then support an intermediate transition from a kind of a, a, a leg segment at the base of the leg into body wall in the evolutionary history of wings. We've basically got now to a situation where we're arguing about the miniature, the details of this, which I think is a really impressive achievement from this impressive set of papers. So for that reason, I think it's really cool. If you want to read more about this, this paper by, um, uh, by Smith et al. into the body wall and back out again, gives a tiny bit more detail for you. So with that, I'm gonna move on to the final aspects of this lecture, and that's actually just looking at development in the fossil record. And you may be thinking, well, you can't get embryos in the fossil record, right? But actually, surprisingly, the preservation of embryos in the fossil record is not unheard of. And there are a few famous examples that I thought I would introduce in this slide. On the left here, you can see some examples of fossils discovered in a phosphate mine in China um, this mine is now quite famous, and these um, cellular structures you see on the left here are members of what is known as the Doshanto microbiota. These are organisms that are phosphatized in cellular and even subcellular detail that date from between 635 and 550, 551 million years ago. These structures have been the subject of much research, and they have been interpreted as the embryos or early stages in it, the embryo of metazoans, so that's animals, including those with bilateral symmetry, so bilaterian animals, as well as potentially stem group members of the animals or members of um, groups of organisms that are non-metazoan, so that are not animals. It seems to be fairly widely accepted nowadays that the embryo-like fossils from this time period probably represent one taxon dividing from a single cell into thousands of cells. Exactly what that organism was is a matter of active debate, and some people actually say that maybe these aren't embryos. We don't really have an answer to this yet. Nevertheless, those are some impressive um, cellular fossils. In the middle here, you can see some fossils from a very famous site of exceptional preservation, a, um, a, a deposit called the Austin Lagerstätter. So these are some Swedish shales with a very specific type of preservation of minute fossils through a form of secondary phosphatization. So that's just the process by which these fossils formed. These fossils are up to two millimeters in length, but we find in this deposit larval animals down to 100 microns, so that's one tenth of a millimeter in length preserved in three dimensions dating from the Cambrian period. 
So we're not looking at embryos here, but we're, showing, we're seeing the early development of a range of animals and it's providing insights into, for example, the origins of arthropod developmental modes. For example, the morphology of these fossils has been used to argue that embryonic development to a late stage within an egg, something we see in both onocophrons, um, velvet worms, and some arthropods today, may have evolved many times convergently across these groups rather than being an ancestral state. This particular example is actually a um, pycnogonid, a sea spider from the Austin um, deposit. And finally, we have more recent embryos of, um, of slightly larger animals shown on the right hand side here, of bigger animals. So this is an example from the world of dinosaurs. This is actually a, a baby titanosaur from Argentina revealed through T CT scanning shown on the bottom here. And this work has shown um, early development of stereoscopic vision within the species, and it has revealed um, significant changes in the, uh, the, the, the rate and, um, uh, and stages of cranial ossification, so head, the kind of the formation of bones in the head, when compared to non sauropodan um, embryos, so close relatives of these dinosaurs that aren't actually members of this group, the sauropods. So those are some interesting insights into the development of dinosaurs. Now, if you want to look at how evolution has evolved by studying the fossil record, obviously you have to be able to spot development in the fossil record. And the obvious issue here is how you tell the babies from the grown-ups, especially if they are animals that undergo, for example, complete metamorphosis and a significant shift in form between life stages. That can be very, very difficult to do if your babies look very different to your grown-ups. The answer here is it depends on how much animals change during their life cycle, whether we can actually do this. And in extreme cases, it is really tri tricky. In less extreme cases, and with good sample numbers, uh, then it is possible to look at um, the development of a species in the fossil record. So in, for example, arthropods, where the animals shed their exoskeleton, you can look at a large number of fossils, look for clusters in sizes of those fossils, and assume that each one of these represents a life stage. So this, um, some of these clusters are shown for a species of Xiphus urin, or horseshoe crab, on the left-hand side here, from a paper by Joachim and Carolyn Haug from last year. But even in these cases, it remains a challenging area and one in which a lot of controversies develop. So to, to finish off this video, I wanted to highlight one such controversy because there is an ongoing debate or argument regarding two dinosaurs that are shown on the right hand side here. One of these is Triceratops. This is an organism that is characterized by this um, short solid film. And on the bottom, you can see a, a, a superficially similar looking skull. This is Taurosaurus, which is characterized by a long open frill. And researchers have, um, have been arguing about the nature of these species. So researchers agree that the frills and horns that are so critical to understanding the taxonomy of ceratopsian dinosaurs have been shown to change markedly over the course of development of these organisms. Some elements become elaborated reduced or fused as the animal matured. On that basis, it has been proposed that the differences between the specimens that have been assigned to Triceratops and Taurosaurus could actually reflect differences in maturity with specimens assigned to Taurosaurus simply representing the adult morphology of Triceratops. That's controversial and it has implications. If it were corroborated, um, it would have significant implications for us, for our understanding of the diversity of dinosaurs, because um, for example, many of the differences that we now use to recognize ceratopsid species could simply result from changes that occurred as the animal grew. So our picture of diversity has been inflated relative to what the true underlying diversity would be. I've given you papers on both sides of this argument. The upper one here from 2012 um, assesses relative maturity 
of um, Taurosaurus and Triceratops specimens by coding their skulls for characters that vary with maturity. Then it uses a clustering analysis to arrange them into a growth series. It uses this analysis to build a picture of skull development within this group and suggests that on that basis, it's not sensible to consider these um, different specimens as part of the growth series of a single species. However, um, this paper from 2010 gives the opposite view, suggesting that actually um, these two do form a um, developmental series. So overall, looking at development in the fossil record can provide insights into how, um, how uh, developmental modes have evolved, for example, but also it comes with challenges, especially in identifying development. And so that's it from me for these videos on microevolution. I hope you found them interesting and I'll see you in our next session.